Excellent. Now I don't find the... Are you seeing my screen? We, we see your screen, yes. You probably need to pick a page. Just a moment. First page? Yeah, it's up and running. Okay. Excellent. <clears throat> so it's a great pleasure to welcome Jose Valle to uh, speak to us today from Valencia. Uh, he tells me he hasn't been to Dublin, so we must get him to visit us and hopefully maybe next year if he can convince him. Um, he is a graduate of uh, Syracuse University, a uh, student of Joe Schechter, and he did various postdocs. I won't list them and pick prizes and things like that, but uh, he is uh, well known for his uh, uh, groundbreaking papers on neutrino physics. So let's uh, welcome Jose Valle. I hand over to you, Jose. So, hello, everyone. Thank you very much for your uh, introduction. Uh, first of all, I want to, to thank my hosts for the kind invitation. My task will be to review the status of neutrino physics uh, showing how the discovery of oscillations has brought neutrinos to uh, the center of the stage in particle physics and also illustrating how neutrinos can provide us with a very useful platform uh, to explore new physics. So I start with the status of neutrino oscillations. Um, Neutrino oscillations, uh, the discovery well, led to the Nobel Prize, to Kajita and McDonald, and it basically dealt with the study of neutrinos that come from the sky. Uh, first of all, solar neutrinos, these are produced in the solar core by nuclear fusion processes, and they are detected in, in the underground experiments and in the Earth. And then we had also uh, atmospheric neutrinos produced in cosmic ray interactions in the upper layers of the atmosphere uh, coming from all directions. They have been carefully recorded. And together, uh, the, these studies led to the uh, oscillation discovery. Um, there are six uh, parameters which are relevant. Uh, I should say that... Uh, these were the discovery experiments. Uh, uh, after the discovery was made, uh, there were uh, laboratory-based studies uh, based at uh, reactors and accelerators mainly, which have not only confirmed the discovery, but also improved parameter determination. And I'm going to talk here about the parameter determination. There are six parameters you see here listed. Uh, three in green, uh, they are well measured and three in red, they are poorly measured. Well measured, you have the solar neutrino oscillation parameters, which is the, the first column on the left. Yeah. Upstairs, you have the solar mixing angle, about 30 degrees or so. And down below, you have the solar square mass splitting, very small, seven, 10 to the minus five electrovolt square. The other well-measured parameter, thanks mainly to the Dia Bay reactor experiment in China, is the uh, one in the upper right corner, that's uh, the so-called reactor mixing. Okay, uh, in the middle column, you have the results that come from the global fit of, solar, uh, of uh, neutrino parameters, and this is the atmospheric sector. Upstairs, you have the atmospheric mixing, which is nearly maximal, but uh, there are actually, the minima are slightly away from maximality. And there are two possible minima, which are consistent with the current data. And this is called the octant prob problem. Down below, you have the uh, atmospheric splitting. Again, here, there is an ambiguity that corresponds to uh, what I show here in, in the right of the diagram, uh, the difference between normal ordering and inverted ordering for the neutrino spectrum. Depend both ordering are uh, possible. 
And that is why all of these, in all of these panels, you see two, two curves. The blue curve is for the preferred case of normal ordering, but the magenta curve is also allowed that corresponds to inverted ordering. So these two uh, parameters are poorly determined, uh, the octant, the ordering, and finally the CP phase, which you see in the lower right uh, panel, it is very poorly determined, especially in the preferred case of normal ordering. This is a more complete view of the three neutrino oscillation parameters in which I arrange along the diagonal of this triangular matrix, the individual, the, the chi-square profiles responsible for in, the individual determination of the neutrino oscillation parameters. You see here the three good measurements we have, and you see in red the three uh, the three loose ends. And I want to stress that besides the individual determination of the oscillation parameters, uh, neutrino data uh, allow for the uh, give provide detailed information on all pairwise correlation of oscillation parameters that you see as the off-diagonal entries in this matrix. Special attention I give to the one I circle in red, which I call the ignorance plane. Ignorance because it, it correlates the two less well-known of the oscillation parameters. Uh, here, the CP phase in the, in the ordinate, and in the abscissa, you have the atmospheric mixing. And you have, again, the magenta and the blue regions corresponding to uh, the two mass orderings, which are possible. I should say that, by and large, we have a pretty consistent description of the neutrino data in terms of the three neutrino paradigm, and also that uh, there are basically three global oscillation fits in the world. Besides Valencia, we have the group in Barcelona, We actually is led by my first PhD student, uh, that's now called New Fit, and then there are the, there is the Italian group in Bari. So neutrino fitting is mainly a Mediterranean affair, as you can see. And everybody is, is more or less in, in good agreement with each other. And as I said, the best, the most well measured of the mixing angles is the uh, reactor mix. Uh, theoretical puzzles, of course, we have many. We have both the atmospheric mixing is uh, large, nearly maximal, and the solar mixing is about 30 degrees. And we don't have really a counterpart of this in the CKM sector uh, describing uh, the quark mixing. Okay, but this is the summary, the overall summary. The question now is uh, the target of the upcoming experiments is to improve upon these poor determinations I have in red. And I will give an example for the case of CP violation. Uh, the cartoon for the Dune experiment, deep underground neutrino experiment in the US, it aims to use uh, neutrinos produced in the Fermilab accelerator complex and he study them at the Southford Underground Research Facility located 1,300 kilometers away. This is actually the same, basically the same uh, facility, the same underground setup where Ray Davis pioneered his studies of solar neutrino back in the 60s. So uh, one of the main uh, uh, goals of Dune is to measure CP violation. And I show here in black the sensitivity with which Dune can determine CP violation plotted versus the value of the CP phase, uh, showing that the significance exceeds five sigma, especially for uh, CP values close to maxima. I also show 
results uh, in color corresponding to the a possibility where the lepton mixing is not strictly unitary. Okay. In that case, we have uh, some degree of degrading in the sensitivity. And I should also mention, which has been actually studied in this paper, the plots are taken from this paper. Okay. They are not official Dune uh, uh, plots, but they are pretty much uh, uh, similar. I should say that Dune has competition from the Japanese. We will have the Hyper-K project in Japan, which uh, may might even come a bit early, earlier. It's too early to say. And uh, in Europe, we have the Spallation Source a proposal, which also aims uh, at many things, including a CP determination. And for CP determination, in some cases, it gives a even slightly better sensitivity. Okay, so much for oscillation. Let me now move to neutrinoless double beta decay. Sorry, may I ask? So, has Dune started taking data yet? No, 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 no. Dune is is working working very hard, but mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to work, it's hard to beat the Japanese. So, I would awesome. not be surprised if the Japanese come earlier. Yeah, so, and, so but, these results that you're showing from 2022, these are kind of uh, expectation? No, this is expectation from a theory paper I that see. simulates the mm. detection features expected at June. Uh -huh. okay. And Thank also a, a, in other experiments, such as the spallation source. Mm. Yeah. But you. the Japanese, they we couldn't find so easily the information to do the uh, simulation. Anyways, I now move to neutrinos double beta decay. This is a long word, so for short, I will just say DBD. This is a very interesting process that would happen in a nucleus in which two neutrons beta decay simultaneously so that the neutrino emitted in one or the antineutrino emitted in one gets reabsorbed by the next thanks to the Majorana neutrino propagator. Uh, and this involves MI, all three neutrino mass parameters, including the absolute scale of neutrino mass, not just the two well-measured splitting in oscillation. The process is sensitive also to the overall mass parameter. And you see also here in red, it is sensitive to the two Majorana phases that characterize the unitary mixing of three Majorana neutrinos. I also mentioned to you that the mixing there is no re reason for it to be strictly unitary, eh? but uh, people assume, of course, unitarity for simplicity. And there are two Majorana phases that appear in the amplitude, which I call M beta beta. I should also say here that M beta beta is presented here uh, in the preferred uh, presentation, eh? which we originally proposed with Joe Schechter, which is the symmetrical one. This is the good parametrization for neutrino mixing, at least when it comes for to uh, neutrinos double beta decay. The PDG choice is really bad for DBD description. It's good for oscillation, but it's bad for DBD. Anyways, uh, M beta beta, uh, that our task is now to explore what we have learned from oscillation and quantify the value of M beta beta given the oscillation results. And this is shown here uh, in terms of this degeneracy parameter eta, dimensionless. So when eta is one, you will have here this black line, the maximum possible M beta beta. This is an idealized limit. In real life, one must depart because we need to generate oscillations to explain the oscillation data. And the two ways to do it are shown here. You either move to the left al along this blue band or to the right along this uh, orange band. These correspond to the case of normal ordering preferred by the oscillation data. And you see that in this case, M beta beta can vanish due to destructive interference amongst the three light contribution. 
or uh, in contrast, if you have inverted ordering, the right branch in that case, there is no cancellation possible. Of course, there are uh, direct searches for DVD. Uh, I give here, down here, some review articles. If you want to look, they are recent. And also recent, uh, the most relevant experimental references for the bounds. And I show them uh, in the form of this horizontal brown band, which comes from Kamlan's end, which is the most restrictive one. <clears throat> and uh, you see that you have to depart from uh, near degeneracy already quite a lot from this data. And even more so because we have also information on the absolute scale of neutrino mass coming from cosmology. And this pandemic year paper of Latanzi et al. Uh, quantified <clears throat> the cosmological <clears throat> restriction on M beta beta and that rules out the vertical band that you see here. I don't know if you see it very clearly. There is a fat vertical band. Yeah. yeah, I think we see it clearly, yes. Yes, so this shows that putting together uh, that nearly degenerate neutrino is uh, extremely disfavored at the moment. <clears throat> so you said the nearly degeneracy is disfavored by oscillation. But from the plot, it also says it's uh, disfavored from... Bound. No, no, no. From oscillation, <clears throat> we don't have this information. <clears throat> this information comes from direct search for DVD and from uh, indirect measurements of uh, the absolute scale of neutrino mass coming from cosmology. Oh, it I is, see. Okay. Not from oscillation. Oscillation is completely transparent to... Oh this. Thank you. So uh, the next possibility is uh, favorable for DVD detection is one in which one of the massless neutrino is massless or nearly so. This happens in many uh, theories. I list four examples here. Uh, a, a very easy way to make it happen is when you have an incomplete neutrino spectrum. Eh? You have some missing partner neutrino. But this is not the only one. There are other theoretical ways to get a massless neutrino. In particular, in one of them, you have an anti-symmetric Yukawa coupling. So the determinant of an anti-symmetric uh, thing is zero. And in that case also, uh, you get one massless neutrino. So this is an interesting possibility. Theoretically and experimentally, it is interesting because the two bands that you see upstairs get mapped to these bands that you see down here. I cannot pl plot it versus the generacy parameter anymore because one neutrino is nearly massless or massless. So it, it's not degenerate with the others, but there is a unique parameter which is free in this case, namely the relative Majorana phase between the two massive components. Okay. So in terms of this Majorana, phase, I can replot uh, the shape of these two bands. By the way, I have not emphasized enough. The shape is a legacy from oscillation results. It is the oscillation who give the shape of these curves, of these bands. Yeah. Plotted versus the Majorana phase, in the case where only two neutrinos have mass, yeah, I get these two bands, and one finds that there is an absolute lower bound in this case okay, for DVD. Unfortunately, the lower bound lies well below detectability in the next round of DVD experiments, which I show here in dashed. The next uh, DVD experiments, Snow Plus in Canada, Legend in the US, and, the, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, Italy and uh, uh, Nexo in the US again. Okay. So uh, even more than in the generic case up there, already in the generic case, Nexo will cover the inverted ordering uh, band. That's the purpose of the experiment. 
but uh, this is even more comfortable uh, if you have one of the neutrinos as massless because the width of these bands is much narrower than the generic one. So uh, uh, even legend can almost cover the parameter, uh, uh, the allowed values for the Majorana phase. And that will be a fundamental discovery. We'll discover also the value of the Majorana phase. I should just warn you that I'm being slightly optimistic here concerning the nuclear matrix elements. This happens for the favored choice of nuclear matrix element for which even now, as you can see from the magenta, already we get some sensitivity. But this happens only if you are optimistic. If you are pessimistic, uh, that's why if you go up there in that plot, there are two arrows, two sets of arrows. The upper arrow is the pessimistic choice. For that case, the sensitivity is still rather poor. But who knows, maybe nuclear matrix element uh, calculations using lattice, using other uh, technology can improve in the future. And then this will become, this dream will become true. Finally, what if all neutrinos are massive though? Then we have no guaranteed lower bound. That is the generic situation. And in this case, what happens is that there is an important legacy from oscillation, namely the measurement of the oscillation angles. Knowing the angles and using a little bit of theory in the form of family symmetries and putting them together implies that more often than not, one finds very restrictive regions as indicated here in color eh, and lower bounds for and beta beta, even when you don't have them guaranteed, even then, even when the ordering is normal. So this is to highlight the legacy and the importance of the oscillation results, uh, even uh, concerning expectations for neutrinoless double beta decay. But <clears throat> I must go back to my PhD once again <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> to stress, sorry, I have a recovering from a cold, uh, that the discovery of uh, neutrinos double beta decay would be for particle physics as important a discovery as the discovery of oscillation itself has been. And this comes uh, from this old result on the significance of uh, DVD. And uh, this is the so-called black box, which basically states that if you ever did discover neutrinoless double beta decay, you can always dress the corresponding amplitude by the W boson, which after all we know is there. Eh? It was the Nobel Prize to Carlo Rubia. And by dressing, you will find from that amplitude, a non-zero amplitude, which is a Majorana entry for the neutrino mass matrix. And that implies that in a deep sense, uh, at least one of the three neutrinos will be Majorana, and there is a deep connection between uh, the Majorana nature of neutrino and the existence of neutrinoless double beta decay. And that is why I put here the picture of Majorana, eh, because uh, this will come in several slides in what comes uh, ahead, that most of the efforts to seek for the ultimate theory of neutrino mass, of which we have a lot of information, but certainly not enough, this search is largely performed in the theory space in which neutrinos are Majorana. And in fact, uh, uh, with Joe more than 40 years ago, we argued that this should be the case, that uh, just on kinematical grounds, the most general expectation for neutrinos will be, would be for them to be Majorana particle, irrespective of what is 
the mechanism responsible for providing their mass. But mm -hmm. I will now move to... So, so, sorry to interrupt, but <clears throat> there's a question from Jasmine in the chat. Yes. Hey. Okay, go, yeah. do you want to ask it? Please. Or something? I don't... Uh, yeah, Jasmine's asking, um, does a massless neutrino lead to infrared divergences? Sorry? D does a massless neutrino lead to infrared divergences? Uh, sorry, massless neutrino in general? I'm talking now in general. I forgot uh, that just, particular it, case. It, uh, well, it's just a general question from Jasmine that um, does a massless neutrino lead to infrared divergences in general? If it leads to, I cannot listen. To, to infrared divergences. Oh, this is a very specific question. Let's postpone it to the end, please. Yes. Okay. Uh, may I also ask a question? You mentioned family symmetries here. I will talk about them at the end okay. of the talk. Okay. Okay. So uh, already in in the eighty nineteen eighty was an important year for neutrinos. Uh, Steven Weinberg noted that even though the standard model lacks a neutrino mass, uh, there is a unique lepton number violating dimension five operator that can be added, which below the electroweak breaking scale becomes a Majorana neutrino mass. So neutrinos should be Majorana. His argument is beautiful, eh? but I would say that even without this argument, uh, the most general assumption, uh, the most justified assumption for neutrinos is for them to be Majorana. However, neither is a theorem and uh, we need experiment to decide. And at the moment, Neutrinos might as well be direct particles. There is nothing that prevents that possibility. But normally theorists seek for theories of neutrino mass uh, in terms of uh, Majorana neutrinos. So Weinberg's argument is a beautiful one, but it is far from being a theory. And it needs a uh, UV completion. And here, the most interesting one of the most interesting UV completion is provided by the seesaw. First of all, because it opens the dynamical possibility of understanding the small neutrino mass as a result of minimizing a Higgs potential. And moreover, this can lead, as uh, emphasized in these recent papers, to the understanding of the stability of the electric vacuum itself by no means guaranteed within just the standard model. So if you are on a, in a seesaw uh, setup, then the small neutrino mass can be understood either from the exchange of heavy right-handed neutrino, okay? this is now called type one seesaw, or in terms of the exchange of triplet scalar boson, now called type two seesaw. It is anecdotal here that in our old seesaw papers in Cyan with Joe Schechter, uh, we called the triplet seesaw the type one seesaw, simply because it is the simplest. Yeah? And the fact uh, that it is the simplest has been recently revisited uh, last year in these two papers where it was shown that the simplicity of the of this seesaw is such that it we will be able to reconstruct it or deconstruct the seesaw directly from experiment by combining various types of experiments such as oscillation, uh, charge lepton flavor violation, and so on. So this is a fact. But I should stress that. Uh, uh, the difference between the yellow and the science he saw was more than that. It was not just terminology. Uh, and it is very visible when discussing the type one he saw. I'm using now the established terminology which came afterwards. Yeah. And uh, it comes from the gauge group with respect to which you study the seesaw. The yellow seesawers they studied the seesaw in terms of left-right symmetry for aesthetical reasons. But the science seesaw, which is the most general one, 
that we discussed with Joe was studied just in terms of the Cairo standard model. And this is much, much, much more general. So much so that it allows us to have any number of singlet neutrinos. In the left-right seesaw of SO10 or left-right or SO2 left plus SO2 right, the number of right-handed neutrinos must match the number of left-handed neutrino by gauge symmetry. However, in the most general standard model seesaw, this is not the case. And one can actually envisage a model, a missing partner seesaw, in which there are less singlet than doublet neutrinos. Instead of right and left, it's better called doublet and singlet neutrinos. So we can have, a, if you have a missing partner seesaw with less singlet than doublet, there will be a missing partner neutrino, which will remain massless, one or two of them, depending on whether you have 3,2 or 3,1. In our old days, we had actually even the left, the number of left neutrinos was arbitrary. We didn't know N was three. Now we know we have only three left neutrinos. So the only possibilities that survive are this. 3,2 is perfectly valid, perfectly valid today. 3,1 is not a complete theory because only one neutrino get mass from the sea. So, for example, the atmospheric scale could arise that way, but we need also to explain solar neutrino oscillation and we need some extra ingredient. But 3,1 is useful because it provides a good template in order to construct viable oscillation uh, uh, models in which you can explain why the solar splitting is much smaller than the atmospheric splitting by a factor 30. This comes from the oscillation data I showed you in the first slides. There is a hierarchy there. And the assumption here is that you can explain that hierarchy, getting a full theory for the neutrino oscillation lengths in terms of having the solar oscillation splitting to result from a radiative correction in contrast to the atmospheric one, which would be larger because it would be three level. And a very nice example of that is has been dubbed Scotto CISO, where in which it is the dark matter uh, sector, the sector of the theory responsible for explaining the dark matter, uh, the one which lifts responsible for lifting the degeneracy and generating solar neutrino oscillation. Okay, so much for missing partners. So we can also have the opposite situation, eh, namely having more singlet than doublet neutrino. For example, 3,6. Eh, that would be a scenario in which you add to your uh, fermion content two singlet neutrinos sequentially. Instead of adding only one, as in the normal high scale, you saw you add two. And if you do so, you can go to a limit where lepton number conservation is imposed. And in this limit, all mm. three light neutrinos are massless, as in the standard model. Yet, lepton flavor is violated. Something which is not understood by many uh, particle physicists. Okay, This is actually a very interesting uh, limit because it elucidates the role of symmetry in the weak interaction. The difference between imposing lepton flavor from imposing lepton number, total lepton number. So, so much for this. This is kind of a, a nice, a conceptually nice example but it's not physical because today we need neutrino masses. So to generate neutrino masses, you use this as the template to construct low scale so as natural theories. And the idea then of the low scale so is that the light neutrinos here you see in the in this diagram Feynman diagram. The left coming neutrino, left-handed neutrino, two component neutrino, and the left-handed two component neutrino on the other side 
they get mass from the exchange of a quasi Dirac heavy neutrino okay, that is formed by merging together the two singlets that you added sequentially. They marry to form a quasi Dirac neutrino whose mass can lie in the TV scale, they can be accessible to collider, and they can also get admixed in the charge current weak interaction, leading to unitarity violation in neutrino propagation, which is a very interesting topical nowadays. And also this quasi-direct neutrino can mediate charge lepton flavor violation. I already mentioned to you the charge lepton flavor violation can proceed even in the strictly massless limit. But today we have masses. So let us look how charge lepton flavor violation is induced in this low case. So here you have it is induced by the exchange of the light neutrinos, new, and also the heavy quasi direct neutrino. And they both contribute. And here you have the branching ratio for mu to gamma plotted versus the size, the typical size of the Dirac Yukawa entry in the neutrino mass matrix. And you can see here that the branching ratio uh, uh, touches the sensitivity of the MEG experiment for values here you can see in blue of the heavy quasi direct neutrino mass in the TV scale. This is from a, a recent paper. But the result itself is not new at all. This is known for uh, 35 years that even massless neutrino can lead to mu v gamma in uh, this uh, <coughs> scenario. And, and also even subtle things like leptonic CP violation. In the quark sector, leptonic CP violation requires all quarks to be degenerate, non-degenerate. Here with two strictly massless neutrino or three strictly massless neutrino, you already have leptonic CP violation induced by the admixture with the heavy neutrino. Yeah. I should also say for completeness that there are two low scale seesaw realization. ISS stands for inverse seesaw. That is what is illustrated here in this diagram. And there is another one which is less familiar to people. It's called linear seesaw, because in that case, the neutrino mass is not quadratic on the dirac yukawa coupling, like you see here, but actually linear. So that is a, 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 an inequivalent low scale seesaw with a similar ideology, but uh, inequivalent. Okay, so much for Sorry, the charge card. question. Yes. Um, can the CP violation be constrained by uh, electric dipole experiments? That is a very, again, detailed question. I don't think we have a huge, a huge value. I have a very ancient paper where I looked at the dipole of the electron. It could be, it could be sizable, but this is a subtle point. This phase is like Vega Sicilia wine in Spain. Uh, it's it's not present in normal oscillation. It's not, it's a little bit, I mean, it will be present in very fine experiments, which at the moment we don't have, but we can come to this later. Okay, so the main point is that lepton flavor violation itself survives the massless limit. This you can measure. This you have huge contribution, and this is uh, interest. Not only the massiveness of neutrino can lead to charge left of flavor violation. Yeah. And is the mu to e gamma the uh, strongest limit from the? Usually so. Usually yeah. so. Uh, I want to mention another mechanism that uh, comes from the linear seesaw, which is this uh, leptophilic Higgs exchange mechanism. It is also interesting. And here, my bottom line point, charge level flavor violation persists even in the massless neutrino limit. 
This result is from 1987. It is not appreciated by many people. Naturalness. How about naturalness of lowest case ESO? Is it natural? Uh, everybody says with a full mouth that, okay, high scale ESO is natural. Yes, it is natural in Weinberg sense. But the low scale ESO is natural in Toft sense. And it by that I mean that there is this one parameter or one matrix that when it goes, and that could be a dynamical thing, when it goes to zero, neutrinos get massless, lepton number is restored, and that, that's naturalness. The value of that entry can be anything you want. Doesn't need to be the God scale. It can be one kilovolt. This is tough naturalness. And this means symmetry protection for the resulting neutrino mass. But now I will go one step further, and I can say, that one can arrange theoretically for the symmetry protection to be a double one by having, instead of just a plain number, to obtain this blob as a, radi a calculable radiative correction. And this can come from another sector of physics. For example, we have left-right models uh, doing that. And here I will stress, because I think it is especially interesting, the possibility that there is a dark sector in your theory responsible for explaining the dark matter of the universe, which produces this, uh, this blob. So the question is, is dark matter the seed responsible for neutrino mass? Yes, it can be so. So you can have a dark seeded seesaw mechanism. So neutrino mass Generation proceeds a la CISO, but the seed is dark. And this uh, it was uh, studied in this paper here. And these slides show how we provide a, a quantitative dark matter a model, providing the dark matter is a wimp. And by the way, weak interacting massive particle dark matter need not have any relationship whatsoever to supersymmetry. So WIMP dark matter can be, for example, the lightest scalar running in this loop. And here is its relic density, eh, which can touch the required value by Planck for values eh, all the way in the, from 50 GV to a TV. And concerning the study of dark matter by nuclear recoil, again, you can have cross-section for that, uh, populating uh, values that lie between the neutrino floor, floor the so-called neutrino floor, and the value in black, which is the bound given by the xenon one-tone experiment and others like Panda X and Lux. Okay? So these colors that you see here, these are values for this nuclear recoil cross-section associated to different values, uh, different benchmarks that give rise to a correct relic density. And I should say, since this model, after all, is a neutrino mass generation model, it is closely connected with charge lepton flavor violation, as I have already discussed. So much for the dark inverse so. Now the dark linear CISO. This is another low scale CISO where the neutrino mass, non-zero neutrino masses are induced by this epsilon parameter. When it goes to zero, neutrino become massless. You have the natural as I already discussed. But these two blue references here show that in fact one can construct theories where this epsilon parameter is not just a parameter, it's actually a calculable quantity. And you have again the scenario where the Majorana masses of light neutrino is uh, CISO induced, but it is seeded by dark matter. And again, it is accompanied by charged left uh, mu gamma, either induced by the standard uh, charge current weak interaction or induced by dark contribution. And uh, to make justice to Dirac, 
There is no reason why you must see so at a Dirac. You can see so, sorry. There is no reason you must see so a la Majorana. You can see so a la Dirac equally well. The only thing life is slightly more complicated, there are more operators. This is type one Dirac CISO. This is type two Dirac CISO. Already here, you have uh, a type two of the different dimension, dimension five and dimension six. So there is a whole bunch of operators. If you take as a classification thing, uh, you have a whole bunch of operators. They have been classified. And moreover, uh, UV completion have been given for these Dirac CISO operators. So everything is the same. It's just more complicated. The basic idea is always the same. Symmetry protection, which here plays a double role. Symmetry protection for the small mass and symmetry protection for the directness of the neutrino. In fact, one type of theory that was suggested was in, in this context that the stability of the dark matter is follows from the directness of the neutrinos. There are some theories of this type. But this becomes a bit baroque. I will not develop. I will just mention one example in which the symmetry responsible for the directness of the neutrino is the Pechequin symmetry. That happens within a scenario involving SU3 left weak interaction. Also uh, goes back to Joe Schechter. And uh, the nice result found here is that to have a good CISO mechanism for the Dirac neutrino, one needs the SU3 left weak interaction, which is weaker than weak, weaker than SU2, but it should be there. It cannot be just decoupled. Uh, I need it to lie below the Pechequin scale for the validity of the CISO mechanism, the Dirac CISO mechanism. So in some sense, it's kind of a nice scenario. Yeah? It, it incorporates the Pechequin symmetry. The Pechequin symmetry is responsible for the strong CP problem and the dark matter of the universe. And also the Pechequin symmetry eh, imply the presence, eh, to justify the CISO, the presence of new physics above the scale of the weak interaction. It's kind of a weak interaction physics, weaker than weak, but it should be there. So okay. may I ask in these uh, dark CISO uh, models that you were discussing, can you say something about the scotogenic models and which category they fall into? Let wait just a bit. I'm just coming to that okay. in four, four slides. Okay, yeah. thanks. But it will be a simpler theory. This theory is a little bit more Baroque. Okay, let me now go think big and think of collider physics. Can colliders say anything about neutrinos? About lepton number violation, about flavor properties of neutrinos, about the neutrino oscillation parameters. This is important because if our field is going to have a future, no. everybody thinks about a proposals like the future circular collider and other similar proposals, uh, such as the ILC, CLIC, or SEPs in China. So I will illustrate how you can learn about neutrinos and about the neutrino mass ordering, for example, and about the flavor of neutrinos by performing this kind of experiment. And to do so, guess what? I go to the simplest CISO, which is the type two, which is the triplet CISO. And this is what I can show you. I can have an E plus E minus collision at three TeV center of mass energy producing a four muon signal. Okay. And the cross section for this process scales with the neutrino mass, the lightest neutrino mass. 
it correlates with the value of the lightest neutrino mass. I show here in these gray bands, vertical bands, the band which is ruled out by the Catherine beta decay search experiment, tritium beta decay search experiment in uh, Karlsruhe. And I show also the bands that are ruled out by cosmology using the CMB and baryon acoustic oscillation. So you should forget to the right of this gray band, but everything to the left is open territory. These are very, very, very tiny neutrino. So we are probing the absolute value, the, the lightest neutrino mass value by measuring the four muon signal at the plus and minus. If the triplet C saw is the origin of neutrino mass. And I, in that context, I have also here a very sizable difference between normal neutrino mass ordering and inverted neutrino mass ordering. The value of the cross section depends very sharply on the neutrino mass ordering. This looks like a spectacular result. It is only possible due to the simplicity of the triplet seesaw, and that is the original reason why we called it type one. But never mind, we now call it type two. Moreover, man can go even further and look at flavor no conservation. I think it relates to your question. Here I, I look at the cross section for E plus E minus. Instead of going to a four muon signal, I go to a three mu plus an electron. And I plot that cross section, not versus the lightest neutrino mass. Remember, charge lepton flavor violation has nothing to do with the massiveness of neutrinos in general. I plot it versus the branching for mu to gamma, computed in the same theory. And the vertical band is ruled out by the MEG experiment. Everything to the left of that band is uncharted territory. So that shows that charged lepton flavor violation may actually be discovered at FCC. Or in other words, high energy collider experiment can be the discovery site for charged lepton flavor violation. All the blank part of this right panel, you'll never be able to probe it in the conventional type of searches that have so far been proposed. Yeah. Progress goes very slowly towards moving this gray band to the left. But all this territory yeah, we can, can be probed by searching for 3 mu E signal in a plus and minus collision. Now I want to say that, uh, something about dark matter, which has already been asked. There is no question that dark matter exists. And uh, the question is what it is made of. And most likely, it is a particle, elementary particle. It's particle dark matter. So I will now uh, entertain the possibility, which was suggested by these two Chinese gentlemen. One is an important professor who discovered this idea 10 years after an unknown postdoc who left the field. Uh, they are both Chinese. The idea is beautiful, is that neutrino masses are radiative because dark matter is stable. In other words, the same symmetry that stabilizes the dark matter also makes it a calculable loop correction. And this idea is now a paradigm, uh, I think almost as important as the seesaw paradigm, I call the scotogenic paradigm. 
Unfortunately, the original models by these gentlemen is a little poor and has some theoretical drawback. Namely, the model is here. The Majorana neutrino mass of the neutrino comes from the mediation of these heavy states, fermions and bosons, okay, in the original model, and it relies on the Z2 symmetry under which these states are odd. So we, the, the, the scalar guy cannot get a web directly. So we cannot have a seesaw contribution. The neutrino mass is intrinsically uh, radiative. Uh, this is, a, as I said, a very nice idea. But you need this uh, to symmetry or something equivalent. And it happens in their simplest model that you lose this symmetry the moment you start running it by the RGE. So it's the model uh, loses its attractiveness and maybe even its consistency. Another thing is that the phenomenology is a little poor because they had only fermion singlets and uh, fermion singlets don't like to uh, to have a non-zero direct detection and cause nuclear recoil. You could still have the, the, the scalars, but not the fermions. So for this reason, people suggested in a series of papers an extension of the model that adds triplet, triplet fermion and triplet scalar. The triplet scalar is very good, eh? this, this guy Omega, for two reasons. First, it restores the stability of the Z2 symmetry. And second, it allows for the three level detection of the uh, fermionic dark matter, making it cause nuclear recoil in the direct detection uh, setups. So this is good. And a third thing that I add is that you see here there is a fermion singlet that's like the binu of supersymmetry and the fermion triplet that's like the neutral winu of supersymmetry. So this model mimics supersymmetric dark matter within a much, 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 much simpler context and one which is deeply connected to neutrinos and can also be checked in other ways, for example, through charged lepton flavor violation. So I think it is a much better model of dark matter. This kind of WIMP is a much better WIMP dark matter model than that that comes from SUSY. Here are the predictions for the relic dark matter density that you get in this model. In green, you can see the region where dark matter is underabundant, but can also reproduce the Planck value for the relic abundance. In the left panel, you have the situation of no co-annihilation. In the right panel, you have the situation with co-annihilation, which is nice because it is much broader. In particular, you can have dark matter uh, uh, WIMP dark matter uh, already uh, above 60 GeV or so. What is the Half different of color the... of the points? Sorry? What is the different color of these points? What does it refer to? Uh, oh, well, uh, I guess I need to go to the paper. Uh, it's uh, a lot of uh, detail. Uh, it's basic, basically parameter sampling uh, mm -hmm. variation. Uh, I will give you more detail in the next plot. Yeah, the but detection. the point is that yeah, you could have a uh, correct relic density at any range. The point, yeah, the, the, that's all I emphasize. So I didn't go to details, not to pollute the slide. Uh, you see, uh, you don't want overabundance because they are ruled out. You want underabundance or the right abundance. Underabundance yeah. is okay if you have another component. Sure. If you don't, you must have the right abundance. The right abundance here covers this range. And here it covers, uh, covers a much wider range. Why? Because there, there are much more annihilation channels of the dark matter in the early universe. Sure. Yeah. And okay. Thank you. So this is concerning direct detection. I mentioned you have it at the three level. And here you have this gives the amount of the dark matter that is provided by the by the fermion, by the stable fermion in, in the moment. 
deep blue means 100% of the dark matter. Deep red means uh, a small amount. And you can interpolate and you can see in pink here, the points that are below the neutrino floor, in light green, the points that are above the current limits of uh, Zeno one ton, uh, Lux, and also the other experiment, Panda X, the Chinese experiment. And you have in the middle, populating the middle, the points that can be studied can indeed be produced by this model uh, in different setups. There are many given in the paper. I just uh, uh, show here two which highlight the importance of having co-annihilation. Different types, uh, benchmark points for uh, <clears throat> co-annihilation effects. And you can see here holes for light dark matter. We cannot have light dark matter. The reason we cannot have light dark matter is that this is a neutrino mass after all. So we have searches for charged leptoflavor violation processes given here and also for production of dark matter directly at high energy colliders at left. All together, they basically, the points are there, but they, they are ruled out. They are ruled out by complementary uh, ways to probe the, the theory, which do not exist, for example, in the Susy dark matter. Because there it's an ad hoc thing. You postulate the symmetry, you have stable stability. And finally, last but not least, one of my neutrinos is massless or nearly so. In the simplest model, I have only one sigma here for the atmospheric scale, one f for the solar scale. One of the neutrinos is left massless. So I have the DPD predictions that I started with at the beginning of the talk. Concerning uh, now uh, a more complete theory. Yeah. The scotogenic can give a theory of dark matter, no question about that. But maybe one wants to explain also if one is in a, in a neutrino scenario in which dark matter mediates neutrino mass generation, a way to explain the splittings of scenic oscillation, the solar splitting versus the atmospheric splitting which is, is this small number here. So the idea is to explain it by a loop mechanism. And that is the idea of the Scotto CISO proposed in these uh, two references. Uh, the idea there is basically that uh, the CISO is responsible for the atmospheric scale and the uh, Scotto is responsible for the solar scale. And that's why they are different from each other because one is radiative and there are many, many phenomenological interconnections and checks that one can make in such a theory. But one must generate the three level neutrino mass by the CISO. And this is a recent example of how to do that without enlarging the CISO. You see, one needs a low scale CISO in order to be able to have all these interesting tests. So, uh, these recent papers show that even in the 3 3, the simplest CISO, one can have a, 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 a atmospheric scale generated a la CISO for one of the neutrinos, which I call uh, one of them, the mediator I call capital N. And the way to do it with the low scale CISO is to make this phi not the standard model VEV, but another leptophilic VEV. It's not the VEV that gives the top quart mass. It is something else. Small because it is arises only as an induced VEV. So one can have protection in the coupling, protection in the values of the mass, and protection in the value of the capital phi mass. So this is a very interesting theory. And in this setup, one can entertain the possibility that the other, imagine now that instead of only one end, I have three ends. So I show here that actually two of the ends are Fs. F by F, I mean dark. They don't couple at the three level. They have negative matter parity. And they have negative matter parity because matter parity 
which uh, protects eh, the stability of dark matter and, and the radiative nature of the solar neutrino mass, it is a residual symmetry uh, arising from B minus L, not the B minus L that Marshak and Mohapatra wrote back in the 80s, but a different B minus L, eh, whose charges are given here, and they are not the standard ones. Two neutrinos have different B minus L from the third one. That is why two of them become dark, and the third one is not dark and generate the three level atmospheric, while the other two generate the loop CISO, is loop is called a solar scale. Okay. This is a solution, is valid concerning the anomaly. So you can actually gauge this symmetry and get a Z prime boson that one can use to pair produce the mediators, the mediators here, the ends, and gets lots of phenomenology out of this one. So this is some sense a dynamical Scott C saw construction. Uh, sorry, may I ask what would be the rough estimate of the mass of this Z prime? Would it have to be light? Or? It does not have to. We can make it light and study the phenomenology. I see. Yeah. Well, I mean, if it's light, then obviously you've got other constraints that yes, yes, satisfy, yes. You know? yes. But we can always escape making it heavy. A new feature of this model is that we have charged leptoflavor violation of a different type, not just mu to gamma, but also mu to e goldstone. There is a goldstone boson in this model, whose profile is given here, and it can be emitted in the spectrum of mu and decay, distorting the Michel spectrum and producing a distinctive feature that has been searched for experimentally. And the bound is given here eh, in the left panel. It is the horizontal line. Eh? But there are experiments aiming to further pursue this eh, search eh, so as to improve the limit. OK. Anyways, I now move to the flavor problem. How am I doing in time? You're doing fine. We've. Uh... No rush. I am. Please, I am. Please continue. I am being terribly fast. I think. No, not at all. No. no. Okay. So the my fixed idea is the legacy of oscillation. How important the discovery of oscillation has been, and I now want to st stress for you the legacy of oscillation concerning the flavor problem perhaps one of the deepest problems in particle physics today, and one for which the standard model has absolutely no answer. The standard model just makes Xerox copies of the different fermion families, stacks them, uh, but there is no rationale for any of the, the mixing angles in the CKM matrix or in the lepto mixing matrix. But uh, oscillations have measured the atmospheric mixing to be nearly maximal and the solar mixing to be nearly 30 degrees to the surprise of a big chunk of the theory community that expected uh, similarities with the CKM. So here I come, the legacy of the oscillation measurement for the uh, flavor problem. We don't even know why we have three families of flavors in nature. I have here the three ice, ice cream cones. We don't know why we have three families and we don't know why the flavors are what they are and behave as they do. However, oscillations have given really a breakthrough in particle physics, not only by demonstrating that leptons mix, eh? here it is a, a schematic view 
of the mixing, you see big blobs here in the atmospheric sector, indicating the atmospheric mixing angle is nearly maximum. And that this uh, solar mixing is very tiny. By the way, it is similar to the Kabibu angle. The tiny mixing of the leptons is similar to the Kabibu angle. Anyways, oscillations demonstrated not only that leptons mix, but also that they do so rather differently from the way quarks mix in the CKM sector. And this is Sorry, shown just the right. a quick question. Yes. Um, why is the blue matrix not symmetric? The mixing matrix is not symmetrical. First of is all, the... because th these are measurements, okay? This is an artist's view of the magnitude of the corresponding number. But even mathematically, the matrix are not symmetrical. There's no reason for them to be symmetrical. The only thing symmetrical is the neutrino mass matrix if it is Majorana. It comes from the Pauli principle. If it is direct, not even the mass matrices are symmetric. Okay, thank you. Okay, so, so I, I was saying that the oscillations show that the leptons mix, not only that they do mix, but all, the, the before we didn't know the lepton mixing was zero. Yeah, we assumed it was just the unit matrix, yeah, but they discover also that the structure of the mixing is not at all what you might have expected in terms of analogy with the CKM. So uh, as theorists, we play with symmetries. And myself, I don't think that the pattern of oscillations and the pattern of mixing observed in nature is an accident. It should follow from symmetry. We just don't know it. So in the efforts of trying to explain the disparity and the structure of the lepton mixing matrix, and in some cases also the disparity with the quark mixing, over the last 10 years, there have been zillion of attempts, some of which are shown here. And the ones shown here, they share a common feature. Namely, they all converge into this beautiful formula I show on top that I call the golden formula. The golden quark lepton mass relation follows as the result of as a common feature shared by all of the references that I give you on the left. So it seems to me that this golden formula, even though we have no final theory of flavor, of course we don't, but perhaps this golden formula forms part of the ultimate theory of flavor, which at the moment we don't know. And here, a theory, it would be a theory capable of explaining the very awkward pattern, yeah, mass hierarchies amongst the charged families. The only thing we know is that perhaps the neutrinos are different from the rest because of a seesaw or because of a loop mechanism like the scotogenic, but uh, we have not the faintest idea why the muon is 200 times heavier than the electron, why the top quark is so special. So I'm not claiming to have a solution of the quark, uh, of the fermion mass hierarchy problem, but perhaps neutrinos have brought us very, very useful information that have implied this golden formula, which perhaps form part of the ultimate answer. But perhaps the ultimate answer is much less obvious than we might imagine. And perhaps it requires a much more radical departure, such as having an extra space-time dimension. Most of these models, most of them here are uh, employ four dimension of field theory, except for one involving Pechequin symmetry. It is also four dimension of field theory, 
but it is kind of inspired by a higher dimension of theory. It comes, it comes like uh, after losing, after compactification. <clears throat> Do we have any idea why the golden uh, formula doesn't involve uptype quarks? Yes, I have a very good idea. Oh, can you tell us? And I can answer you right now. Yes, please. The, this formula existed in the literature, uh -huh. uh, adding here another piece, uh -huh. which was M, exactly what you were saying, the up piece. Yeah, m top over square root of m u times m c. And that is a t over u c, but that is totally wrong. Oh. Eh? That piece is totally wrong. Mm -hmm. I will also say the person responsible for that formula, which we did not know originally, we found this formula about uh, 2011, we found this formula. Okay. Eh? But only recently I knew, I learned that we'll check had that formula with the three pieces. Oh. Okay? Yeah. But the formula is wrong. And that is the basis for the collaboration we have had uh -huh. recently in this paper, in which we showed that thanks to the peche Quint symmetry in a kind of nice scenario, eh, we eliminate the wrong piece of the, the relation. But I should also add that in all other references, this formula is obtained directly as it is without the wrong piece. Oh. Okay, it is obtained without the wrong. The reason is very simple. The Higgs boson couples to the down quarks and to the charged leptons. That is the down Higgs boson, not the uptight Higgs boson. And that is why we never got the wrong piece of the equation. Okay. Can I ask but, a question about the equation? Um, when you factor out the Higgs VEV, it's just a relation between your Kawa couplings. How does it run under the RG? Is there some energy scale? It's fantastic. It, it almost doesn't run. We can impose this the symmetry responsible for this formula almost at any scale we want because the running is very mild because it involves only mass ratios. In contrast, and by the way, it has nothing to do with gut. It is not a Bitau unification from guts. In that case, eh, the famous Jory Yalsko formula, it's uh, messy. It gets modified a lot. In fact, Bitau unification is modified by a factor three. That's the reason it works. You impose it at the gut scale, you get the factor three down below. Here, it is another story altogether. And it involves, in other words, it does not come from guts. It comes from family symmetry. Family symmetry that can be imposed at the standard model level or higher because running is almost absent. So do we know what kind of symmetry it is? You see, all these references is a different paper. You can look at each one of them. Uh -huh. They are different family symmetries. Some of them not necessarily very pretty. I'm not saying that it is that any of them is the theory of everything. Yeah. But they are honest theories, honest models that make their predictions. Some are nicer, some are not. Mm -hmm. So uh, my argument here is that perhaps uh, explaining family symmetries, explaining flavor, mass hierarchies and fermion mixing really one should go wild and perhaps extra space time dimension may help. And uh, this brings me to the possibility of having a fifth curled up dimension, which has been dubbed Ward favor dynamics. Uh, it is kind of inspired by these fam famous people, Lisa Randall, Arkani Hamed. These people suggested that mass hierarchies may arise from geometry. It's very elegant, it's very beautiful, but becomes a mathematics problem. On the other hand, mass hierarchies does not exhaust the flavor problem. We must also explain mixing angles. So we entertain the possibility that perhaps we have some fancy uh, word explanation for the hierarchies, but 
concerning the mixing, we can adopt a non-abelian family symmetry within the context of four-dimensional world uh, dynamics, uh, geometries. And uh, the idea here was, to, uh, what has been achieved was to show that the imposition of a non-abelian family symmetry is consistent with the warping in, in, a, in a complete sense, in a gravity sense. And what is interesting is that such a fancy uh, construction can lead to very simple prediction for the mixing, neutrino mixing parameter. Theta one two is the solar mixing, theta one three is the reactor mixing, theta two three is the uh, atmospheric mixing, and delta CP is the CP phase. And here you have two analytical relationship that follow as a consequence of this 5D word construction. It looks like a miracle, but it is not. You can check the paper, the reference is given here. And this pattern, by the way, existed before in the literature. It was proposed phenomenologically, and it's called TM1, TM for tri-maximum. And here is this prediction mapped into what I called earlier on the ignorance plane, delta CP versus the atmospheric. That is the least well-known sector of the oscillation uh, picture. And here you see a very tight correlation, which is a prediction that follow from T and one on the modulus of delta CP versus the value of sine square of the atmospheric mixing. And these two vertical lines are the prediction, sorry, are the measurement, depending on whether you have normal, uh, normal or inverted mass ordering. Eh? The dashed is for inverted ordering. The solid is the preferred normal ordering. And in magenta, you have the sharp theoretical prediction. Can and I ask a question? Jose, yes. why is the right-hand side of the second equation less than one in magnitude? Sorry, Bal. In the second equation, cos delta Cp modulus is less than or equal to one. Why is that the case on the right-hand side? Sorry. Cos is always smaller than one. By... But what about the right hand side? Sine theta, sine theta, there are three sine thetas. Why can't they become small? Well, uh, here, no, 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 no. I mean, it, it obeys Pythagoras, it obeys trigonometry. And the question is I mean, this is just a straightforward thing that can be done. But what we are doing here to get this value is to put the measured values of each one of these mixing angles together with their three sigma uncertainties. And putting all that together, we get this three sigma prediction. And I overlay on the prediction the central value of sine square theta two three from, again, from measurement. So here everything the theory comes only in deriving these equations and the other is a map of the equation to the plane taking into account the measurement. Okay. I don't understand why the theory gives such an equation where without knowing why the right-hand side is bounded. It gives a correlation between solar and the reactor, the upper equation, which is very simple. That is okay. The second one. That is the, the product is constant. And the second is a bit complicated because you have here, you know, you don't have squares here. It's not so I don't see I don't see your problem so simple. Maybe you are a very fast thinker. I don't see any obvious problem with the formula. And in fact, the reason because it has been checked by many, many, many people. 
at the phenomenological level and also theoretical level. Well, I, I presume it's just the constraints that the model produces. Yeah, there well, are, the model is it, saying there's a constraint on how small these three mixing angles can be. Constraints certain angles to be sine theta one three, for example. Suppose it becomes very small. The model is saying it can be. It's a constraint, and that's why I am asking how the theory gives that answer. Not the experiments. No, the theory only gives these two correlations, nothing else. Fancy okay. as it may be, in the end, for neutrino oscillation, these are the two predictions. What is remarkable is that I mentioned to you that norm. Not always we get. Usually we get correlations, and they are they are they are not analytical. What is remarkable here is that they are just two analytical formula coming from such a complicated setup. Okay. Okay, so neutrinos are Majorana. So I also have uh, DVD. And these are the two generic bands for DVD in green and this other color. And the predictions, you see, they are ex extremely sharp. Red and blue are the predictions for inverted and normal ordering respectively. But neutrinos are Majorana. There is an alternative setup based on five-dimensional warping in which neutrinos are direct. In that case, there is no DVD. But uh, the prediction is also obtained in a similar construction, and one finds again an, a different analytical uh, pair of equation, which is TM2, trimaxima 2. Now, one dimension further, one can go something which is fancy in string theory, but this has nothing to do with string theory. Orbifolds. Imagine that space-time is six-dimensional orbifold. You compactify on a torus. Ball is very good at these things. In the end, the nice conclusion that one finds, this has been developed in these three references. Uh, what one finds is that in four dimension. There is only one possible symmetry. Ultimately, it comes from the extra dimensional isometries, but there is only one symmetry that can be identified as family symmetry, and that is the simplest that we can use to stack together the three families in the triplet, namely A4, the symmetry of the tetrahedron. This was this result already existed before these references. I think it was coming from a Mexican guy and Steve King. Uh, actually, the Mexican guy is our collaborator in these references. Is that Eduardo Pinado? So the nice thing is that you know. I mean, typically when you make... Remember the, this table here. How many models? These models, they, and then there are zillions of models. Each one has a different group. Delta 54, Delta 27, T prime, whatever. S4 and so on. Here, that problem is solved for us. We, we must have an A4 symmetry. But that does not solve all the problems, okay? This is not the end of the story. The nice thing about this construction is that, again, we get our beautiful a golden formula. Okay? And I translate the golden formula here into the uh, experimental uh, prediction for the down and strange quark mass. And I must say also that a global fit of the flavor parameter was performed, and it works even for the CKM. No predictions there, but it works. Concerning neutrinos, we have also prediction. Prediction for the ignorance plane that I mentioned before, the, in the deltas, the atmospheric sector versus, so delta CP versus the atmospheric mixing. Uh, the regions allowed by uh, uh, obtaining the fit are shown in, in I don't know this car this 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 color, I don't know which one is it is. There is a magenta in points and there is a magenta in region. The magenta in region is comes from the oscillation global fit. It's just experiment. The magenta points they are theoretical prediction of the model. So one sees that the theoretical prediction fills up regions that overlap with the experimental region. 
And also here, prediction for DBD. The preferred DBD, uh, one expects to have DBD in this model because uh, even though these values they are allowed here, but the preferred the region tends to be upstairs. So I conclude. The Higgs discovery is not the last brick in the standard model. Even though the Higgs boson is central in the standard model as the source of all the masses, uh, and its discovery definitely marked uh, 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 an important uh, milestone in our in our knowledge. The discovery of neutrino oscillations marked another equally important milestone, which have brought neutrino to the spotlight eh? and initiated a gold rush, eh? a very vibrant experimental neutrino program that is going on at the moment for since the discovery of oscillations and is proceeding. There are, there are many, many, many experiments which are underway and in planning to improve our knowledge of neutrinos. And my ambition in this talk was to illustrate how this can have a theoretical significance as well. First, I noticed the close interconnection between dark matter and neutrinos could be beneficial to the study of both. I showed how the dark matter can see the neutrino masses, as he saw, and how they can just mediate neutrino mass in the within the full scotogenic picture of Ernest Ma and Tau. But I also illustrated now how neutrinos can teach us a lot about flavor in particle physics. And I did not cover a few things because after all, I'm getting tired. <laughs> For example, relation of neutrino to the strong CP problem, or to unification, and even to standard model anomalies. And the, the bottom line that I wanted to emphasize was that one may expect unexpected phenomenological imprints of such neutrino completions at colliders, in CLFV experiments, experiments searching for lepton number violation like DVD experiments, and, uh, and even uh, future colliders like FCC perhaps can probe the neutrino mass ordering that currently is is unknown in neutrino oscillation experiments. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much for uh, a superb excursion through a vast area of uh, neutrino physics. Um, and let's have questions. Okay, I, let me ask, Excuse did you talk, or maybe you have listed it, how the standard model uh, doublets, standard model uh, issues, representations, generalize if you include all these neutrinos. And what happens to the anomaly cancellation between the strong and weak, I mean, between the leptons and the quarks? Maybe you have talked about it. I didn't know. In what context exactly? No, if you add the extra particles, you have to put them in standard model gauge group. Yes, yes, yes. No, and, let, let me start with the CISO. Mm. Eh? Let me start here with our CISO that we call type one, is now called type two. Um, here we have only the triplet, okay? But the general CISO, actually, <coughs> we never liked the zoology of, uh, okay, although we classified, we never followed too much on that. The type one, the type one, the guys of left-right symmetry, they had left-right symmetry, and that's why they put an equal number of lefts and rights to cancel the anomaly. Eh? And they could not have, for example, a missing partner seesaw. But the most general seesaw we had with Joe, we had only singlets added. The singlet fermions. You, they can come in any number. They carry no hmm. anomaly. 
And that's mm. exactly why we can have a, a viable missing partner scenario like 3,2, 3,1, Scott or CISO, et cetera, 3,6, which is the basis of the low scale CISO, and so on. So I have only, I have mostly considered standard model based uh, uh, setups, except, except here, when I discussed the dynamical Scotto CISO, the simplest is just standard model, gauge group, but the dynamical Scotto CISO, I gauge B minus L. So I must cancel the anomaly. And I cancel the anomaly in a non-standard way. Okay? One in which two neutrinos carry a different lepton number from the other. When this is broken, and we need to break to give the Z prime mass, and so on, to break that symmetry, because after all, all we see at low energy is the standard model, then we have a residual, unbroken, matter parity, which is such that it the two first guys are odd and the third guy is even. So the even guy mediates the atmospheric scale at the three level, while the two odd guys have no three level lead, do not mediate neutrino mass at the three level, only at the loop level by symmetry by the dynamics. And this symmetry has a Z prime that couples to this right-handed neutrino. This is a genuine right-handed neutrino, while the other two Fs, they are dark fermions. And the scalar is a dark scalar. And one of them gives the dark matter of the universe, the lightest of them, which will be stabilized by the matter parity, which is a residual symmetry of the gauge construction. So this model again, uh, 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 yeah, this this we needed to carry about anomalies. Most of these remaining models here, I think they are all standard model based, except the one with Wilczek. Let me see if I uh, if I oh gosh. Okay, let's see if I find it. That's actually, it brings me to, uh... okay, here it is, I think. Do you see the slide? Yes, mm -hmm. yes, we do, yes. So here it was, I will say, what was our motivation? Uh, this is the original paper we wrote with Frank. The idea here was the following. Motivated, inspired by the beauty of S of 10, which I'm sure Bal likes very much and, and Dolan and many of you, <coughs> we try to see if we can explain flavor in terms of uh, spinorial matter. In S of 10, you have a 16, you put all the matter there. That's the standard S of 10 gut. So the idea here would be to go to a big, bigger SO group uh, so that the huge spinner, when you break it up, uh, in uh, it gives rise to the pattern of families, the repetition of families that you see in nature. So people tried this before us, I think. Uh, but everybody stopped. And this is, by the way, the problem is chirality. You get, for example, SO18, and you get this huge spinner, 256, and then you break it up, and you get eight, I mean, you get 16, eight plus 16 bar, eight. You get mirror copies. And the mirror, the, the, the world is not mirror symmetric. So this is a problem. This is a typical problem in string models. That's why in string models, people go to heterotic compactification because that is compatible with chirality. You solve the chirality problem. So the idea here uh, was to, to do this in a kind of using the boundary condition. Eh? 
using the boundary condition in the UV and infrared brain, you can decouple the mirror from the uh, spectrum of the low energy. But still, you have eight families, not, not three. Mm. And here, Frank had the idea that these eight, uh, you could uh, break this uh, SO8, uh, and that includes an SO3 cross SO5, and SO5 can, can bind together. It's like a hypercolor group. So by confining that, and we did a little study, uh, not very thorough, this, I think this, if someone really wants to pursue this, there is a lot of work to be done. Uh, the coupling constant associated with the confining group really can confine. And that way one can get rid of the five unwanted kind of families of families. So the idea was, as I said, to promote Minkowski to five-dimensional uh, anti deceiver and in this warp scenario, uh, find a, a possible origin for a, 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 the flavor problem. But I still did not reach there. All I did was to get rid of the mirror by boundary condition, to get rid of the unwanted five unwanted kind of family by confining them, by binding them together. Eh? But I still I have still to my disposal an SO3 group because SO8 contain SO3 cross SU, SO5. Eh? SO3 can be used as a family symmetry. By the way, all the examples I gave before, the family symmetry was just a non-abelian discrete symmetry. Here, the family symmetry is assumed to be a continuous SO3 family. So, so well, that was the connection. The good well, observation that I already noted before was that when you obtain the mass formula the, 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 between yeah, quarks the and leptons without the unwanted piece with the up guys because of the Pechequin symmetry. So we have an axiom. The axiom is responsible for, uh, so what can I say? Here I also had a, a why this came into, into discussion, because you mentioned about anomalies, but actually we didn't worry here with an anomaly because SO10, we are using the 16. I don't think we have any problem of anomalies. And SO32 also is the same, right? SO18, sorry, SO18. This is a huge symmetry. This is, for me, this is almost science fiction. Normally, my phenomenology is a standard model based, which is, uh, but it is nice to see possible connections once in a while. In, yeah. But Jose, in all of these models, isn't the Higgs sector enormous? You have an enormous not of always. Fields. Not always. Let us be a bit. Even more in SO10, you have, a, I think, the yes, yes. A, you look at a 44. Sorry, the this example is science fiction to me. Yeah, okay. I, I tend to agree. Yeah. But uh, warping also is science, a bit science fiction. But yes. it is nice that you can get from such sure. it's complicated thing, thing, you can get simple physics. That's, mm -hmm. I think, nice. Yeah. No, no, yeah. I agree. Yeah. Now, most of the talk was on low scale CSO and scotogenic models. There, there are there is plenty of phenomenology, and the phenomenology is is, is handleable. It, it can be handled. It's not. Uh, it, it 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 can be handled, and it has been largely handled by many people, not only ourselves, by many people. Just, can I clarify one one statement? You said that. Uh... Normal ordered uh, scenario is favored by oscillations. That's really not a big. That's uh, mild. That, Both are allowed. I yeah, I thought, yeah. It's it's only very mildly favored. Is yes, it? it is less than yeah, three okay. sigma. Uh, this yeah, okay, all right. It's it is it is possible. And and can I? What would you say is the minimal model here that uh, that explains? both dark matter and uh, neutrino. 
the neutrinos. I it. don't know. I, I am very fond of the dark sea. So the dark, I can give you the, the slides later so you can check because all the references yeah. are given. Yes, or please send me the slides. Most of yes. them. The dark sea saw is a very interesting moment. Both the dark scalar, sorry, the dark inverse and the dark linear. You mm -hmm. can check. There is only the standard model Higgs boson there. Yes. Well, well, well. In the dark inverse, okay. only the standard model Higgs plus a singlet. In the dark linear, you have a leptophilic guy who play a key role in inducing mu to gamma, in uh, providing new production mechanisms for the neutrino mass mediator. It's really a nice theory. It's more complex, but it is yeah. quite nice and can be handled. Mm -hmm. These are very nice. And the Scotos saw, I think it's very cute because reconciling the CISO paradigm just for the atmospheric and the Scotto just for the solar, explaining the ratio, it's a very cute thing. And these are, mm -hmm. again, theories that you can do the phenomenology for. And in fact, many aspects have already been discussed, but many are still to be completed. Yes. There are other questions? Can I ask a very simple, very quick question? Go for it, Brian. Um, where does the name Scotto come from? What, what is, what's the origin? For Scottogenic, oh. where does the name Scotto come from? From Scotland, of course, Brian. Well, <laughs> you mean the word? Yeah, the name. Oh, I think yeah. Scotto okay, okay, okay. I give you. <laughs> the word was invented by Ernest Ma. And uh, Ernest, he pick, he worries a lot about, I know because I have been his collaborator a few times. He likes to give catchy names to things. He likes, he's a creative, very creative guy. And uh, he went to Wikipedia, whatever he found. And he the word Scotos apparently means dark from the Greek. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it is actually funny that the model he proposed in 206 eh, um, existed since 1996, exactly the same, without the name. Yeah. It's, uh, it's funny. Uh, and uh, what we did was to improve it. I mean, to think along similar lines to discover to propose the dark sea saw because I think it is different to seed the neutrino mass than to mediate the neutrino mass. There is a slight technical difference. The neutrinos, but the idea is similar in both cases. So the the in the dark sea saw neutrinos are produced a la sea saw neutrino masses, but the seed is dark, so you have a wind. But this wind does not know of supersymmetry, so you can search it in its own way, in many ways, in fact, uh, 